Um, it's great to see so many energetic faces after the very long day that we had, uh, but it was a very invigorating, um, very engaging day that we had with deep ideas, diversity of ideas, and, and highly stimulating for all of us able to attend. We are just about to begin another session now that we are focusing on uh, with pedagogy. And I'm going to pass over to the main uh, moderators for this session, uh, both Walter and Renato, to lead us through this. Good morning, everyone. Uh, and thank you, Margaret, and all the organizers for inviting us to moderate this very interesting um, pair of sessions because there are a lot of points to cover. Uh, under the same name, Dagoji. So I will um, shortly introduce or yeah, introduce uh, um, a, a general panoramic of what the discussions are. And I'll uh, leave the, the microphone to Walter, who is organizing and chairing the session. Um, I went over the different aspects of what pedagogy means and what the aims of, of these four um, discussing subjects were, and I find that uh, it could be uh, much more complex than yesterday uh, because of different reasons, and I will, uh, I will uh, start from another point and I will uh, end up by saying why I think it's, it's, it's pretty complex. I would like to start by saying that uh, with by uh, uh, clarifying that the word pedagogy uh, is equivocal as many of the other words we were discussing yesterday. So um, actually in pedagogy, depending on each tradition, and we could see from the, um, the different uh, participations of different colleagues all over the world that they understand pedagogy in a different way. Um, in that sense, uh, pedagogy is a very interesting word because uh, many, including Werner Jäger, who was one of the great, one of the last philologists who, I would say, uh, invented the term, used the term paideia or paideia in, in Greek in order to define it or to make like a great summary of what Greek education was. But he starts his work by saying that the Greeks didn't use that word for education. So it was just later on, towards the third and second century BCE, that the word paideia meant what he really means. So, so Plato and, well, of, co of course, Homer and other Greeks did not use the word in that sense. Uh, so having said that, uh, pedagogy comes from, from, from the Greek, but um, it could be used in different terms. In the German tradition, it's uh, considered as the science that deals with education in general terms. But in the English and French tradition, pedagogy could also be understood as didactics, the way in which we teach, the way in which a student learns. So um, we have, uh, despite of these very different perspectives on what pedagogy means, uh, it was very interesting to see that in all the cases in uh, in, that we are discussing, uh, the whole issue is how do we bring a theoretical discussion into practice? And that is, I think, the most important thing. Uh, from a way of understanding uh, the relationship between anthropology and education, to teacher training, to some specific uh, curriculum uh, discussion, all of these uh, elements are very, very important because they bring together whatever we discussed yesterday, the way in which we perceive culture, human beings, etc., and so on and so forth, uh, in such a way in which um, how do we get this into the different spaces? How do we think about education in very particular um, entours? So um, I would like to share um, this discussion and saying that we shouldn't uh, necessarily discuss and wh why we think they're different, but like uh, the, the, the place of the other, the way in which we uh, relate education and thinking. Is thinking only a rational way of approaching reality? Should we also think about emotions and 
other uh, human perspectives on the way we see reality. Uh, how do we understand passive versus agonistic pedagogy, etc., etc., etc.? I just want to end by saying that uh, we might not understand pedagogy in the same sense, but we all know that the, the importance of bringing whatever we discussed yesterday and whatever we did not discuss yesterday into action. So having said that, uh, please, Walter, I, I give the microphone to you. So thank you, Renato. Good morning to everyone. Thank you for being here. Thank you for organizing and receiving us. And um, so as Renato said, just said, so one of the main issues for us is the relationship between theory and practice, and mainly the issue of how can we be coherent between what we think and the way we act, especially about education, about teaching, about learning. So we thought that in order to put this in practice, we, we both think that, and yesterday this was mentioned, that in education questions and questioning is really important so that education, one of the main issues in education is learning, teaching to question and to question oneself, being oneself not just an individual but a whole community, putting ourselves into question. So we thought that we might do a short exercise now. So instead of asking you to answer questions, we are going to ask you now, each of you, to make one question that you think is the main question on this pedagogy dimension, on this pedagogy field. So if you, if you could put what you think, not in terms of answers, but in terms of a question, and you can choose one, just one question. Please think just one question that for you concentrates your main worries thinking about pedagogy. And I would like to invite everyone, the observers, also to do this exercise. So if you could, because this also had to do with the way we think and the way we practice. So if we believe in education as dialogue and as a practice with all, it wouldn't be nice if you just observe some others questioning. So we would like everyone in the room to experience this questioning. So please, everyone, and write the question in a sheet of paper that you could then give to someone else. So that not in a, in a, um, in a book or in a, I don't know, in a, you know, write it in a paper that you could pass to someone else. Hello, good morning. So we are just beginning, and we are going to do an, a questioning exercise, trying to put into practice what does it mean to question. So we are asking everyone in the room to just think, try to be just sincere. It's enough if you are sincere. It's, it doesn't need to be a very sophisticated or important question, abstract. No, it needs to be your question, something that really questions you, that is something that you don't know. So if Anyone needs a paper? We have here papers we can give you. So that just, okay. And if you want, you put your name in the paper. And, and I'll give you some time. Any question, Any question concerning pedagogy. pedagogy? So pedagogy is our theme. So any question that you think is relevant to think about pedagogy in our times. So please, please all of you feel I mean, it would be, we would be thankful if everyone writes, it could be any question, just a question that for you it's important, and you write the, the question, okay? So Renato, maybe we too also write a question. So again, it could be any question. What is a question? That's a good question. But let's say a question is something we don't know. So it could be anything we don't know and we want to know, we want to think about concerning pedagogy, any, anything.
Margarita. We have begun and we are asking because we are going to do an exercise. We believe it's important to try to be coherent. So we think questioning is very important. So we are asking everyone to write a question, any question that is relevant for you in relation to pedagogy in, and write it on a white sheet of paper. Okay. Okay, you don't need to give, just keep the question and when everyone is ready, we're going to read them. So the ones who are outside, unfortunately we don't have, we will not have time to read all the questions, but keep the questions and we are going to do something with your questions. You don't need to give them to us. Just write them and put your name on the question. And everyone is ready? We, you have all made the question? Yes? No? Need more time? Need a paper? We have here. It's important, I mean, it's important that everyone makes a question. So we cannot go on if you don't, you, you're not making a question, you're not going to take part. So it's, it's sad to, to, to be outside. Okay, yeah, keep it. Keep it, yeah. So we are going, everyone here has finished the questions? Okay, so now we are going to read them here. So the microphone is passing. And what, what is the exercise now? Please, we need to pay attention now to everyone's questions. Because in the following step, we are going to stay, each of us, with one question, but not with our question. So we are going to offer our question to someone, or we are going to ask someone questions because we want to work with it. So it's about paying attention to which questions we are interested, or to which one we would like to offer our question, or to, from which one we would like to receive her question. Okay? Unfortunately, we cannot do it. It would be nice if we could do it with everyone so that we could listen to all the questions, but it's, uh, it's, we don't have time to do that. We don't have time? No, we don't have time. We don't have time. So we are just going to do this, and we are going to think a way that you could also do this thing. Maybe while after we listen and we change, you also maybe change the questions between, between you. We'll, we'll, t we'll talk about this. So who wants to begin? Following up on what um, Renato was saying, I asked myself, what is the specific character of pedagogy and paideia in the Greek antiquity, mainly in Plato's state? And I think I have to try an answer. I did some, you know, I was questioning this, um, this um, situation and doing a lot of investigation in that. And the important thing is the mimetic approach to education, and I think okay, this no, is something but now we it, forgot. Now it's just about reading the question. It's not about answering. <laughs> just read the okay. question. I ask myself, what is the specific character of education and pedagogy in Plato's state, and in how far this understanding of education is important for today? Great, so pass the microphone, and we are going to read each of us the question. My question is a, probably a too elementary, but how can a teacher prepare herself adequately to ensure that she is able to facilitate the process of questioning with the right motivation in her students? Thank you. I happen to sit next to Minakshi, but this question is more or less similar. Although I must say I didn't see her writing her question. <laughs> but um, my question is, given the growing concerns of academic freedom globally, um, how do we ensure that teachers are best prepared to 
impart values of tolerance and acknowledge their responsibilities to preparing students as global citizens. Thank you. Um, first thing that came to my mind was Nietzsche has become the one you are, so my question is who are we becoming? Sorry? Who are we becoming? Mm -hmm. um, Thank you. So my question is um, what is the role of pedagogy outside the formal arrangement of the classroom setting? Thank you. So my question is, can we apply the term pedagogy also to adult and higher education? Uh, if the essence of education lies in process that is social in nature, then why do we emphasize on individual learning alone, and that too limited to the cognitive domain? Uh, do we need multiple types of pedagogy for teaching different things and different types of things to different groups of people and students? What does it mean to say, become what you are as a goal of pedagogy? So my question is uh, in another way similar to Andrew's. but. <coughs> I don't know if this is what he meant. Uh, how may we develop a pedagogy in school education that is concerned about the inner life uh, of the subject or the individual in relation to society? So I have a personal question. How can we work with philosophical ideas from great thinkers without losing our own? So my question is, what is the importance of questions in education? Uh, my question has emerged after years of teaching in high school and being a parent and working with recalcitrant students. My question is, how can educators promote curiosity so that students actually want to learn and inquire and um, be really excited about the complexities of life in order to promote well-being for all. How can we come up with a universally applicable education which is based on harmonious development of compassion and wisdom? Would you mind writing it? Please read it. Oh, okay. Written in my heart. <laughs> <laughs> um, the question is, uh, what are relations between uh, knowledge and uh, state of mind uh, of the person being ed educated, uh, especially uh, taking in consideration uh, um, the uh, uh, instances uh, of uh, the, uh, those relations uh, nowadays uh, in terms of um, informational flow or uh, overflow? Uh, my question is, uh, how can we teach so that students come to value what is valuable? Okay, so Randall, you're the last one, right? I'm the last one, yes. Okay, so now we are going to begin exchanging our questions. So each of us is going to stay with, with, with one question, but not your own question, any other. So we might begin by Randall. So now, Randall, even you offer your question of someone who wants the question of Randall says, I could like that question, or you want someone to give your question, and you invite someone to receive it, and the person can say, yes, I, I accept that question, or no, I prefer another question. Uh, so oh, so would, you, would you like my question? Beautiful. <laughs> so would now, you like the microphone? Too? Now, John, yeah, you keep the, also the microphone, and you do the same thing with your question now. You offer it to someone, or someone asks you your question. And All right, I freely offer my question to someone. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And you pass, the, you pass the microphone with the question, with your question. Yeah, no one's. No, no one answer. wants? No. Oh, really? I, I, I accept okay. that, yeah. I have the microphone, so in this case, <laughs> um, so my question, anyone wants my question? It's what is the importance of questions in education? Great, it's in good hands. <laughs> Receive the microphone and the same with your question. Oh, 
Am I supposed you, to start? Yeah, with your question, you offer it or someone? Yeah, oh, my question. question. Could I give you my question? <laughs> oh, but I have Jones already. Oh, you do. <laughs> May I give it to you? Thank you. Okay, so uh, I received Menakshi's um, question. Anybody wants my question? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody wants my question? So what, why we are doing this, I think the observers can talk to the persons you are close and try to do the same thing. So try to change your question so that each of you remain with a question that is not your question but other. You can do this now while we... Uh, who would like my question? Is there anybody? Anyone like my question? He's closer. And I'll just give him a question to Christoph. So I'll give my question to you. Okay. So who I would like to The question is how can educators promote curiosity? And I think this is a very basic question. Um, and my answer would be... No, no, please, no answer. Now it's just the question. We, we might do that and that, but this is an exercise just of questioning. So this question, I'm trying to answer this question. No, we are not, but in the exercise we are not answering any question. We are just doing questions. So, uh, everyone has already? Oh, your question? Can I give it to... Yeah. You've explained already. So, Andrew and I can. I already have. Does anyone still with her original question? So, Timo, do you want to give it to Timo Christoph? Yeah, okay. That's me first. Take the plate away. And now, Timo, you have to, okay. to offer your question. Who still needs a question? <laughs> there are people fighting for your questions. <laughs> so, desirable question. Anyone else? It, Maybe you, um, Krasimir, you are stay, still with your question? I'm staying with my question. Okay. Can you offer it to you? You don't want to. No. Ah. Okay. Who else doesn't well, still? I have, I have. Oh, you have. Who doesn't have a question? Everyone has. Has already. So in yeah, this so case, I think uh, we can no, we can change because uh, you, we you change. yeah, we, we, we don't uh, okay. we cannot stay with our question. Okay. So now that we all have another question, what are we going to do with this question? What do you think we can do with this question? Trying to answer. We are trying to answer. No, we are not trying to answer. <laughs> so this, this is an exercise of questions. So we are going to do another question to this question, right? We are going to offer this question another question. We are going to question this question. Which question we would offer to this one? And we write it down or, or in the other side, OK? How do you make question to question of this question? So what question this question makes us think? If we think about this question. But I might think of an answer to this question. Yeah, but now we are not interested in answers. Answers are very valuable things, but not in this moment. You can leave the answer for another moment, and this moment, think about a question you would like to offer instead of an answer. A new one, a new question to that question. A new exactly, a new, a new one, question, exactly. In the context of this question. Exactly. Yes. If you, usually, when we receive questions, usually we answer. But it's not the only thing we can do with a question. We can also offer another question. So if you offer another question, which question would you offer to this question? related to this question, that you think helps the other person to think about this question. Okay? It's like a short dialogue between questions. Okay? And again, please, the observers also do the same thing. So you write a question and you give it back to the person.
So, again, so what are we going to do when we finish the question? Okay, okay. So, um, while you finish the questions, I'm giving time. So, it's so feel, yeah, with calm, relax. When you finish your question, you give it back to the person who made the first question that you received. And the next task will be, what will be the next task? Once you receive <coughs> another, qu exactly, John. So what are we going to do? We are going to put the two questions together in just one question, right? So we are going, this is the last thing we are going to do. We had one question. Now we are going to receive one. So we have two our first question and the one we receive. And we are putting those two questions together. And that's the end, and then we are talking about the exercise, okay? On a separate piece of paper. Sorry? On a separate piece of paper. No, no, it could be in the same. Yeah, on the same thing. Thank you so much. So again, the exercise is, we made one question, we give it to someone else, and someone else gives us back our question with another question, and we put these two questions together, okay? So at the end of the exercise, we are going to have in our paper three questions. Our original question, the question we received, and the last question we made out of the two first ones, okay? So once we are, unfortunately, Again, it would be nice if we could all share this process. Unfortunately, we are just going to share in this group, but then you can do that among yourselves and, and reflect on what has been going on. So while we finish, um, I would like just to comment that the, we thought about this exercise with Renato. While we were worried about this idea of being coherent between the theory and the practice and doing the, what we think and giving the importance to the things we think are important, so as we think that questions are important, we thought that this might be an interesting exercise also to leave something that we are used to do in education to answer, especially this idea that we think that somebody questions because she doesn't know, and the one who knows answer, and the one who doesn't know questions. And we might see here that it's not so simple, that, some, that questions have a lot of knowledge behind, and that we need to know a lot of things in order to question, and that we can move through questions so that it's not needed always to answer a question. It's not the best thing always to answer a question. Sometimes when we answer a question, we just kill the question. Mm -hmm. And sometimes when we give another question, we give new life to this question. And when we listen to the question of the other, it is a practical exercise of thinking together through questions.
So we need to take into account the other in order to do our final question. So it's a very simple, quick <coughs> exercise of how can it look like to practically and concretely think together and not just think isolately. So let's see the results and, and how we have been working. Do you want to begin, Randall? Yeah. OK, here's my revised synthesis question. How can we teach so that students come to value what is valuable, not only what is useful? OK, so th this is your last question? Yes. OK, and can you read the f remember the first yes, one? Yes, right. So uh, we began, how can we teach so that students come to value what is valuable? And, and then the counter question was, how can we um, how can we value utility less in order to value the valuable more? And so to put those together, well, that's how I tried to put the two together. So what the moment you do was to bring inside your question the utility. The yes, the and so, but I'm, but I'm interpreting valuing utility as valuing things that have instrumental value. Okay. that are useful, right? And so, and the, the sense of it from my, can I explain? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the sense of it from my point of view is that I think, I think people are often just fixated on, the, <laughs> on what has utility value, what's useful, and not focusing much on what is actually intrinsically valuable. Okay, so, so in this case, the exercise, the, the last question, let's say, is more broad, it's more... Um, in a way, it's more, it, it's more pointed in the way it focuses on the contrast, the default against which we have to struggle. Okay, thank yeah, you. Thank you. So now we are just going to do this exercise, trying to read the questions and trying to see what has happened with our thinking moving from the first, not answering the questions, but trying to see what has happening, moving from the first question to the third question, as Randall has just said. So who else wants to follow? Mm -hmm. So should I go through all the questions again? Mm. So the first question, my question was, how can a teacher prepare herself adequately to ensure that she's able to facilitate the process of questioning with the right motivation in her students? The answer to that that Renato gave, why does the teacher need preparation? We all need further knowledge, but isn't the teacher already prepared to some extent? And the other question, mine to Renato, do we not need to always put our certitudes to continuous scrutiny? Is that not pedagogy as process? Mm. So it looks like a very different question, right? <laughs> like you have a uh, focus on another aspect or dimension? How, how could you read your own movement? I think that, that it, when you say that the teacher is already the repository of knowledge, uh, you are, um, uh, in a sense, marginalizing, not marginalizing, you're undervaluing the process of learning with the student. Um, in the san Sanskrit, they say samvagachun. We mean together, uh, explore together. Uh, so are we not saying that there is a certitude at one end and there is emptiness at, a th I mean, there is an empty vessel at the other and we pour the so, knowledge into So the questions reveal two different attitudes towards what does it mean to teach or what's the... No, I think they are, they're pretty much in harmony. It's just a question of degree as to there is, there is open, it's an open-ended thing. It's always open to continuous scrutiny. And there's also a question of learning from the student as well through the questioning process. Thank okay, you. Okay, thank you. Should I go next? Um, Walter, I think the, um, the original question was um, how do we prepare teachers? Um, how do we ensure that they're adequately prepared to impart values of tolerance and respect in the context of the growing concerns of academic freedom? And uh, Andrew's responded, pointedly to question what is the best way to ensure that teachers can actually educate students about values that are important to them. And the follow-on thinking is there are several challenges 
and how do we address those challenges in ensuring that um, teachers are given the space to maintain that freedom, which will enable them to inculcate the right values. Okay. So again, we are going to move this. If anyone wants to reflect on the, the movement between the questions, you can do that. Or, or else, if not, we, we just move around and who wants to share, uh, we follow. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I started with become the one you are. Kazimir responded, um, how can you know who you are as a goal of your becoming? And then I responded with another question is, how can, we educa how can education become a question of becoming a new entity every moment? <coughs> so you introduce education, okay. Yeah, and I would say a moment can be a moment or it can be a year or it can be a lifetime, so. Mm -hmm. um, so the uh, initial question was, uh, what is the role of pedagogy outside the formal arrangement of the uh, classroom setting? Um, and then the second question to follow that in response was, um, how do we define pedagogy outside the classroom? What does it mean? Um, then I followed that with, who gets to decide definitions and practices of pedagogy outside the classroom? So um, it seems there's been a shift from a focus, perhaps uh, a focus on um, pedagogy as purposeful in a functional sense, maybe geared towards a set of predetermined aims or outcomes, and then it more or less shifts towards a focus on, well, on what basis do we decide those aims and, and who is included in the shaping formulation of those definitions. And also maybe the question of power, who decides? Power, sure, and struggles over power. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So the initial question was, uh, can we apply the term pedagogy also to adult and higher education? And the question of uh, water was, uh, how many meanings can you think about the term pedagogy? And so my third question was, is there a common semantic, semantic kernel of first pedagogy as a general educational science, second pedagogy as modeling of teaching, and third pedagogy as guiding children? It refers to uh, to the remarks of Renato, basically that there are two meanings of pedagogy. One um, referred, is referring basically to the continental, to the German tradition, pedagogy as educational science. The second one, education, uh, pedagogy as uh, instruction, teaching, and so on. But there's also a third one, and this was the invention for me in this uh, process of reflection. So the initial meaning of pedagogy was, I think, guiding children. And this is a third meaning of pedagogy then. Okay. Okay, thank you. So we might, if you want, we might also now read just the first and the last question, okay. just to see the movement. Mm -hmm. okay. So the first question is, if the essence of education lies in process that is social in nature, then why do we emphasize on individual learning alone? And that too limited to the cognitive domain. So uh, the third question is, how can education as a social process have, uh, sorry, hone our individual and collective abilities, capacities, and sensibilities? Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Uh, I kept wondering, is pedagogy like letter, singular and plural? Is, yeah, there's no pedagogies, is that right? So my original question was, do we need multiple types of pedagogy for teaching different things and different types of things to different groups of people? And then the modified question is, is a disposition of being able to relate well with and have empathy with a diversity of people necessary to a pedagogy for uh, the learning of different things by different people at different times. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Do you want to comment or? Um, yeah, I suppose the first question was about different so sorts of practices. So it was pedagogy and the sort of instruction. Uh, I suppose the modification of the question is it's that there's also something in addition to the practice. It's the disposition of the people uh, that are framing up the practice. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the first question was uh, very simple. 
elementary metaphysical question, uh, become, <laughs> become what you are, what does it mean? Uh, and the uh, second question is, does this question assume that what we, uh, the, what, we, what we truly are is good and happy? Uh, that's exactly what I expected. <laughs> Philosophers <laughs> work like that. <laughs> it, it's obviously kind of, uh, I mean, attempt, to re uh, attempt at refutation. <laughs> the, the, the question is a hidden refutation. Namely, obviously, if we become what we are and we happen to be nasty and mean and uh, perverted persons, then, then our education should aim at that. Uh, and that seems to, the whole thing seems to presuppose something very posit positive and optimistic view on the human nature, which, is a long, <laughs> which starts a long discussion. Of course. Okay. Uh, this, uh, uh, this, uh, I learned this thing from the uh, Orthodox Church in fin Finland. It's uh, so it's the Eastern idea. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. So the first question was how may we develop a pedagogy that is concerned about the inner life, the moral world of the subject in relation to society? Uh, the third question is, how may we develop a pedagogy about the inner life of individuals so that we may initiate the process of understanding interconnectedness between ourselves? Mm -hmm. You want to comment? Well, I just want to say the Bob's question pushed me because he said, uh, how do we know we are connecting with another person's in, in our life? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Renato. So my question was, how can we work with philosophical ideas from great thinkers without losing our own? And uh, after Poonam's um, question, which I would like to read, how are ideas generated and discussed in a certain point in time and history critical, uh, are critical to understand the present context? So that made me think about the original question, and it came out like this. How can we work with historical and past ideas, taking into account our own understanding of the present in our own context? OK, so my question was, what is the importance of question in, edu in education? What is the importance? And my question now is, are questions equally important in all areas of education? So th the question made me realize that it might be not the same importance that we should specify in different areas. Uh, and mine is quite related. Um, the original question was how can educators promote curiosity so that the students actually want to learn? And Christoph's question was why is curiosity so important for education? Uh, and how does curiosity like to be relate to being, I'm not too sure, that word, but is that the airing of questions, why is that so important? Well, I'd say wondering. wondering, ah, thank you, wondering. And that forced me to think about the, um, the assumptions I was making about curiosity itself in terms of education and going right back to Plato and the idea of drawing out rather than putting in. So my new question to come out is um, uh, sorry, pedagogy for education involves drawing out not putting in, like training. Therefore, how do we invite students to come out freely using their own questions, such as we're doing <laughs> right here? Thank you so much. Question I got in exchange of my question was, what are relations between knowledge and state of mind, especially what are the examples of this relation nowadays in learning? So I asked another question, which is really like almost like an answer. <coughs> so my question was, what is the benefit of mind packed with the knowledge, information, without wisdom? So what I was trying to say is, when you talk about relation between the mind and knowledge, and then you can talk about mind filled with the knowledge, and more uh, strangely, information. We call this age, age of information, very proudly, but much of the information is junk information. 
So I was really trying to say that we don't need much knowledge or much information, but we need practical wisdom. It's interesting because you are saying, I was trying to say, no, I was trying to question. So you were trying to, to say things through your question. Exactly. OK. The question uh, uh, I received uh, from Gishel Haktor uh, was, uh, uh, how would you teach young people of a harmonious uh, growth of compassion and wisdom? And uh, uh, the last question that um, I've got was, um, uh, do you think that educational reality becomes uh, just different phenomenon in case if uh, educators divide these two, um, these two goals, compassion and, uh, and wisdom, um, comparing with a case when uh, they, uh, when these uh, goals are taken in unity? So I would say that um, I've problematized uh, the question that Gishel Hakto raised because he raised a question which which was more a kind of positive uh, um, uh, um, mental construction, and uh, I problematized it. Okay, thank you. I think Christoph hasn't read. Yeah, I was uh, referring my first question to um, Renato's introduction, and the question was. Um, um, is there a specific concept of education in Plato's Republic? Um, and in how far is understanding this concept of importance for us today? Mm -hmm. And then uh, I got the, the hint by Timo, Timo saying um, that I, it, it would be interesting to look at the imaginary and at the real aspect of it. And I use this to be more precise. And my last question is, what role does mimetic processes play in education? And what is their real and their imaginary, what are their real and their imaginary elements? And that relates to the um, rediscovery of the importance of mimetic processes. OK, thank you so much. So in this case, it has helped you to be more precise, to, to, to to add some elements to your previous question. So we have seen that different things have happened in this process of, let's say, dialogue, dialoguing through questions. I hope you can also do this maybe later with, with your questions. And we could continue this exercise in many ways, but unfortunately, we don't have time. But I would like that we can reflect a little on the exercise so that we can now it's not continuing the exercise. We have finished the exercise, and now let's think the, about the exercise. What do we think about the exercise? How, how, what have we been doing? What, have, what are the things that you think that you have noticed that called your attention, that could be anything? Just let's do a short conversation about the exercise. Who wants to begin? Mm -hmm. No, it just reminded me of, of a letter I received many years ago from a friend who said that if I had more time, I would write you a shorter letter. And uh, when we do this, uh, we are forced to, in some senses, uh, think of our thought process more, put it under scrutiny, and also with an economy of words, and cut out the fluff and try and get to the center of what it is that we want to communicate and connect with the other person. Thank you. And thank you for this putting us through this exercise. Thank, thank you. Yeah. I think, uh, first of all, thank you, because we haven't done that so far this at this meeting and many other meetings. I think it really uh, sh brought out that how we need to listen to others. Because it was when I was not just thinking about my own question, but what somebody else also posed in that context, that I was able to understand my own thought process better and thereby reformulate that question. So not working in an enclosed ivory tower kind of situation, but always working in relationship. I think that really uh, brought that out very clearly to me, because the reformulated question 
in everyone's case is actually a far better question. So if we work in context of relationship, I think we are far more um, articulate, far more deeper, and far more uh, in, you know, questioning. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for doing this with thank us, Walter. You. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Walter. Initially, I was apprehensive, but I must say it enabled us to, enabled me to focus my mind much more it, uh, sharply, actually. The response, um, I, uh, my question was a lot more general, and the response enabled me to think through how I might actually focus it and narrow it down to make it um, a lot more manageable in terms of what needs doing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I thought that all the women would speak first, but <laughs> you have your you have your, you have your hand ready. Yeah, that's okay. Well, the exercise made me think about also about the different levels and uh, dimensions of uh, interpersonal communication, because <laughs> on the one hand, is uh, the kind of subjective level. So I'm trying to, to formulate a smart question. So I'm, I'm trying some, somehow to present myself, so to, to, to struggle for recognition by the others. And this is, of course, a kind of, uh, if you know, this disruption of the, uh, this is disturbing the communication. But on the other hand, there's also the, the aspect of the contents of the topic. And I think that uh, the exercise was successful in terms that uh, it, makes me at least to focus on the topic and to forget myself for a moment. <laughs> Which is so difficult for all of us, exactly. right? Uh, well, first of all, I think it broke uh, quite a few of the taken for granted uh, thinking about questions, you know? I mean, questions typically for educators are about seeking answers. That is one thing that was broken. But interestingly, the power of the question in actually initiating dialogue and the power of the question in enabling conceptual leaps, I mean, that, that came across so interestingly. So I think it's an excellent pedagogic tool. Thanks. Uh, thank. So we have just a couple short comments, and then Renato is closing. Just Randall, and then Renato. Or maybe just one. Yeah, well, I, I thought the exercise demonstrated something that's evident in reading the Socratic Dialogues, which is it's, it's quite possible to lead people to uh, recognize something by posing a question. And maybe sometimes it's a more effective way of getting them to recognize something than telling them. So you're seeing more than the Socrates in the group? <laughs> <laughs> So, okay, so. so we could just continue forever making questions. Um, I, I strongly recommend Walter's work with uh, a, a short version of Socrates for Children in uh, favelas in, in Brazil, uh, with, and, and it, it really works wonderfully. I would just like to ask you to please, uh, since I'm the one who has to write everything down, uh, would you please pass the, the, the little papers to me? Uh, as well as the public around us, we are going to to take that into account for making the memorandum. Uh, we uh, have to wrap up, so uh, we will continue with all these subjects about alterity, the other, and many beautiful things uh, after after lunch in our afternoon uh, discussion. Uh, I would just like to end by saying that Plato in his Republic uh, the cave we all know as allegory, but in Greek, uh, Plato says it's an apikason, which is like a graphic description parallel to whatever I want to say. What is the difference between paide, like somebody that has, ha has been educated, and apaidevsia, which means something like not something, someone that has not been educated. So uh, it's very interesting because we might be doing an apikason, a graphical description of what it means to be educated and non-educated. <coughs> so this dialogue will continue after, uh, after His Holiness uh, greets us and we have lunch. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.